Well, good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you can hear me. We are continuing our series, The God of the Bible. We're looking at the character of God, trying to find out what God is really like and how the character of God affects us. It has a dramatic impact on us and on our lives. Tonight, we're going to think about the mercy of God. The Bible describes God as being rich in mercy, which is a wonderful, a wonderful description. Uh, some people are rich in friends. Some people are rich in wealth and gold. Uh, some people are rich in maybe talent and ability, but it's wonderful that God is described as being rich. He's rich in many ways, of course, but he's rich in mercy. We're going to think tonight about the mercy of God. Now, in one of our previous episodes, we did look at grace. And grace and mercy are very similar. We think of the grace of God, we think of the mercy of God, and we might think, well, is there a difference between the two? Well, I think there is. Grace is God giving us something, and mercy is God withholding something from us. Grace is God giving us blessings that we could never deserve. That's a wonderful truth, that God is willing to give us things we can never deserve, but he just gives them out of his grace. He gives us eternal life. He gives us forgiveness. We don't deserve these things. These are wonderful blessings from the grace of God. But then mercy withholds what we do deserve, and what we do deserve is God's judgment. And so when God exercises his mercy, he's keeping back something that we deserve, the judgment that we deserve. And it's a wonderful thing to appreciate the difference and to enjoy the reality that when grace is spoken about, God has given me something I don't deserve. But when mercy is spoken about, then God is withholding the judgment I do deserve. We're going to think about that uh, this evening. You know, when somebody is looking for mercy, they're not arguing about right and wrong. They're not protesting their innocence and looking for justice. They don't want justice. <laughs> if, you're, if you're pleading for mercy, you've already accepted that you're in the wrong. If you're pleading for mercy, you've already accepted that you're at fault and you deserve to be punished, and you're, you're just casting yourself on mercy. You're not looking for justice. Justice is no good. Justice would only condemn me, but I'm looking for mercy. I'm looking for the judgment that I deserve to be withheld from me. And somebody looking for that accepts that they are in the wrong. Well, it's wonderful to know, dear friends, and I want you to think about this tonight. It's wonderful to know that the Bible, the God of the Bible, is described as a merciful God. Throughout the Bible, we read about his mercy, and he's rich in mercy. That means that uh, there is a there is a wealth of mercy. There is a God does not dispense his mercy in a in a grudging, uh, stingy kind of way. He is generous in his dispensing of his mercy. There's another scripture that tells us that he is abundant in mercy. Now, some of you remember uh, when you were at school, William Shakespeare. I think it's uh, the Merchant of Venice. He talks about the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth from heaven as the gentle rain upon the ground beneath. And what he means is this, the quality of mercy is not strained. He's saying true mercy isn't restricted. It comes naturally. It falls like, like rain upon the earth beneath. There's an abundance of mercy. And dear friends, the Bible tells us not only is God rich in mercy, not only is he abundant in mercy, but it tells us this, that he delights in mercy. <laughs> That's wonderful, because God is not, he doesn't have to be reluctantly forced almost, backed into a corner to, to show his mercy. He loves showing his mercy. He delights to show his mercy. It gives him tremendous pleasure to show mercy. And I think if we grasp that tonight, it might change our view of God altogether, and it might change our lives altogether as well, when we realize that God is a God who loves to forgive, who loves to withhold his judgment. He loves to show mercy. Now, tonight, I want to turn to the Bible to find that there are two great incidents, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, that illustrate for us the mercy of God. And we're going to think about that this evening. First of all, in the Old Testament, I want you to think 
about the experience of a man called David. I'm sure you've heard of David, King David, the second king of Israel, the man who as a boy or as a young man uh, slew Goliath the giant. We all know the story of David. And David was a remarkable man. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. He was a very special man. And yet one day, David committed a dreadful sin. He saw an attractive woman. And when he inquired, he discovered that she was married, but her husband was away in the army. And he sent for the woman, and he committed adultery with another man's wife. And she sent a message back to him and said that she was expecting a child, and it was David's child. Well, David thought, what am I going to do? And so he contrived to bring her husband back from the army. And he hoped that if he could spend some time at home with his wife, then perhaps when this child was born, they would all just naturally assume it was the husband's child and not his child. And David's plan misfired because the man wouldn't go down to his house. He wouldn't, he wouldn't go to see his wife. And he wanted just to go back to the army to fight for David. And David was driven. Once he started on this pathway of going down and down, he was driven to actually write a letter to the captain of the army and say, set this man, this husband, set him in the most dangerous part of the battle. And when they're fighting against him, abandon him so that he's killed. And that's exactly what happened. And David basically committed murder by proxy. And the message came back to David that the husband had been killed in the battle. Well, David waited until the time of mourning was passed. Then he sent for his, this man's wife, and he, he brought her to him, and he married her. And it seemed as though David's plan had worked. Nobody knew a thing about it, but God knew about it. And God was displeased, the Bible says. God was displeased. And God sent a prophet to David, a prophet called Nathan. And Nathan told him a story. Nathan told them about a, a, a poor man who, who didn't have much, but he'd won you lamb. He'd won lamb. And this lamb, it was almost like a family pet. It was brought up with the family. And you can imagine it uh, being fussed over with the children and so on. And it was more like a family pet. And next to the poor man, there lived a rich man who had everything. And a visitor came to see the rich man. And the rich man wanted to prepare a feast. And so he sent and he took the poor man's you lamb. And he took this ewe lamb and, and he, he, he used it in the feast. And David, when he heard the story, he was furious. And he said, the man that did that, that man is going to die. And I can imagine Nathan just pausing a minute and then said, David, you're that man. You're that man. And suddenly David realized that his sin was known. And the devastating guilt and shame and the enormity of what he had done came crashing into his mind. He was a completely broken man. His, his schemes, his plan to cover up what he'd done had been completely stripped away. And suddenly he realized not only had he sinned against this woman, not only had he sinned against the husband by having him basically murdered on the battlefield, but he'd sinned against God. And he was devastated. And you can read about his experiences in the book of the Psalms, how dreadfully felt, how he, he groaned under the weight of his guilt. And what is he going to do? How is he going to make this right? Well, we're going to read about this because in Psalm number 51, this broken man, broken with a sense of his guilt and his shame uh, and the enormity of his sin, and he comes to God, and this is what he says, Psalm 51, verse 1, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Further down in the same psalm, in verse 16, he says, you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Dear friends, David comes to God, and he realizes there is nothing I can do to, to remove this guilt. I, there's nothing I can do to make things right. There's nothing I can do to atone, to redeem myself, to make atonement for what I've done. There's not even a sacrifice. I could offer all the sacrifices that the Bible talks about. There's not one sacrifice that will, that will fit this case. 
he came to God absolutely guilty, confessing his sin to God. And what he did was this. He just cast himself on the mercy of God. And he said, God, have mercy. Did David deserve to be punished? Of course he did. Did he admit it? Yes, he did. But David grasped this, that the God he was dealing with was a God who was rich in mercy. And he just, he had no hope, he had no plea, he had nothing to argue. He just cast himself on the mercy of God. And the wonderful thing was this, dear friends, that he was forgiven. And God forgave him. And in another psalm, uh, David says this, I will confess, I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Dear friends, David learned the secret that God was a God who was rich in mercy. I don't know, maybe somebody listening to this, and you've done something, and you think, could I ever be forgiven? Could it ever be, could it ever be blotted out? Dear friends, your only hope, your only hope is the mercy of God. That's your only hope. There's no sacrifice you can bring. There's nothing you can do. You, you, your only hope is to cast yourself on God's mercy. We come to the New Testament. There's another scene. The Lord Jesus told the story. It's about the Pharisee and the tax collector. They both went up to the temple to pray. And the Lord Jesus told how the Pharisee, the religious man, he stood where everyone could see him. And he, 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 he prayed with a loud voice. And, and he basically told God how good he was and how, how he'd done so well and, and how he was different from other people. And he was so religious and he was so, he was so worthy. And, and he deserved God's blessing. And uh, he, he, whether his eyes were closed or not, but he suddenly noticed there's a tax collector in the corner there. And he said, well, at least I'm not like this tax collector. And, and he was so proud and the tax collector, he's just sneaking in at the back. And the Bible says he stood at a great distance away and he bowed his head and he smote his breast. That was a, an expression, a, a, a gesture in Middle Eastern times to denote how repentant and how they felt something so that grieved them. And he bows, feeling his own unworthiness and sinfulness. And listen to what he says. You'll find it in, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18. And the Bible says this, that the tax collector would not lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord Jesus said, that tax collector went home justified. He went home forgiven. He went home with his guilt dealt with. The word that this tax collector used is very important. It's very interesting, this word for mercy. God be merciful to me, the sinner. It literally means this, be merciful to me on the basis of the sacrifice. You say, well, hold on. David said there was no sacrifice he could bring. No, there was no sacrifice he could bring in one sense. But as the tax collector is in the temple, and the animals are being brought in to be offered on the altar. And perhaps he sees there's a lamb there or there's an animal there and it's being slaughtered. And he doesn't really understand what's going on. But he, he makes a kind of connection between his guilt and his need and the fact that he deserves to be punished. And this animal that's suffering. And he says, God, be merciful to me on the basis of this dead lamb, this lamb, this offering, this sacrifice, somehow that's taking my punishment. Somehow I don't understand, but this animal's dying for me. Dear friends, I stand at the cross, a guilty sinner, absolutely no excuses, no way, no mitigating circumstances, nothing to excuse myself. I stand before God and I recognize I'm a guilty sinner. I deserve God's judgment. I deserve hell and the lake of fire. I deserve that for my sins. And yet I stand at the cross and I, I see God's son, the Lord Jesus, hanging on the cross. And I don't understand. I don't understand everything that happened there. But I make this connection that somehow his death on the cross, his sacrifice is somehow for me. 
and, and it was on my behalf, uh, and that somehow he died so that I could live, and, and that this has to do with taking my guilt away, and I cry like the publican, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Be merciful to me on the basis of the sacrifice of your son on the cross. And the wonderful thing is that when someone comes to God like that, they experience the mercy of God. And they, 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 they discover for themselves that God is a God who is rich in mercy. Let me just say this. Some people refer to the tax collector's prayer as the sinner's prayer. And they say, well, all you have to do is just repeat the sinner's prayer. You can, you can say these words, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And perhaps many have done that. And they say, well, if you just repeat the sinner's prayer, then you're okay, you're saved. Dear friends, you can repeat these words. There are no magic words in the Bible. You can repeat any formula you wish. You can repeat these words and it has absolutely no effect whatsoever. This man, he was giving expression to his faith, his trust in God. And you can use his words if you wish, but remember this, that he was justified because he exercised faith in what God had revealed, the sacrifice that God had given. And when I come and I realize that Jesus died for me, it's not saying the right words, it's not praying the right prayer, it's relying upon what he did, accepting my guilt, confessing that I'm a sinner who deserves eternal punishment, but Jesus died for me. I simply trust him and I experience his mercy. Let me ask you as we close, have you experienced God's mercy? Have you discovered that he's rich in mercy? Have you discovered that he is abundant in mercy? Have you discovered that he delights to show mercy? Dear friend, God is standing, willing, and ready to show you mercy tonight. Because Jesus died on the cross. The price has been paid. The Lord Jesus has been raised from the dead. And if you're willing to come like the tax collector and simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, trust on him, Believe that when he died on the cross, somehow you don't understand, but somehow he paid the price for your sins. And if you come to God on that basis, God will show you his mercy. He is a God who is rich in mercy. Make sure that you experience that. You can do it even tonight. Let's pray. Father, we give thanks that thou art a God of mercy, a God that delights to forgive and to pardon. We pray that somebody listening to this message may realize that yes, they are guilty, they are deserving of judgment, but that they may cast themselves on thy mercy and believe on the Lord Jesus and find salvation and forgiveness in him. We pray for thy blessing tonight as we give thanks in the Savior's name. Amen.